I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this is Outside My Window. WICON is a non-profit organization which aims to support the gaming community, game developers, and stores by providing demonstration services for board, card, role-playing, and miniature games. It's an all-ages event, and they make every effort to provide games that are appropriate for younger gamers. As proud members of our community, they're pleased to support worthwhile charities in Yarmouth and the surrounding area. WICON was held this past June 2nd to 4th at the Rod Grant Hotel. In the midst of the local wildfires, the con was a welcome distraction for many, taking the opportunity for a little R&R away from the stress and pressures. 20-plus vendors registered for this past year's con, which carried from the expected comets, games, and artistry. Malcolm Seaboyer is the president and marketing coordinator for the WICON committee. We took a few minutes to chat with him midweek. It has been an incredible weekend here at WICON uh, 2023. There has been a ton of people through the door, um, absolutely more than 2022. We're setting new attendance records. Um, of course, the convention, though, is never really about the total numbers. It's about the content and quality, and that is ever-present. There's been so many smiles and happy faces. Uh, people f- discovering new things, vendors shopping, tournaments, friendly play. It has been wild and amazing and uh, couldn't be happier with uh, all the support that Yarmouth has brought out. This has been a tough week for Southwest Nova Scotia. Very, very tough. Um, I grew up in Shelburne. My heart is so in that community halfway right now, like in uh, Barrington and Tantallon and everyone right now affected by the Nova Scotia wildfires and continues to be. So we, we're in Yarmouth, and there's been, you know, some people having a happy distract, distraction this weekend, um, doing something for the community to, to get involved with. Um, you know, there's been people displaced from their homes right now in, in the Rod Grand, and they've been able to come down to Wicon, put on a smile and for at least a little bit through some very tough times. And I'm so proud of all of our volunteers, all of our executive committee for pulling this together. It is such a team effort, and uh, I couldn't be happier with how the event has gone and what it means to more than just Yarmouth, more than just Yarmouth, the town and the, the county. It's, it's huge, 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 huge. Thank you so much. There wasn't a point at, at, at any, any spot there where you thought, geez, it's not really the right time to be running a convention. Definitely. We we're always monitoring that situation. Um, if, um, if Yarmouth had, had to be evacuated, we would have had to make a different call, but we were safe to proceed um, as per provincial regulations, Rod Grand regulations, um, and we plowed through, set up, and and absolutely nailed it um, with hosting this thing. I mean, and we, we talk about it a lot, that uh, nothing happens without volunteers and sponsors. No, it really doesn't. There are so many sponsors um, that we have to... You know, just thanks so, so much. Um, so I'd like to shout out first the province of Nova Scotia. Absolutely amazing support um, for community events, um, coming in to help the event. Um, thank you so, so much to the province. All of our local um, municipalities and the town of Yarmouth and municipality of Argyle, uh, municipality of Yarmouth have all supported the event um, within Yarmouth County, which is amazing. Um, I got a shout out to my day job, Yasta, Yarmouth and Acadian Shores Tourism for helping promote this event, support the event, uh, sponsor the esports component of it, which is coming up as of I record this. It's on Sunday. It's so excited. I'm can't wait to watch the uh, Smash Bros. and Mario Kart finals. Um, We have Ignite Labs, which is a rural innovation hub, if you haven't heard about it. um, Check it out at igniteatlantic.com. They help uh, entrepreneurs and small businesses get off the ground, and it has been so, so cool to see that grow. Credit Union Coastal Financial has sponsored the amazing cosplay contest, which we are recording in the Rod Grand Lobby, and there's been so much cosplay, it's insane. (laughs) This... this, uh, contest has been amazing there's been so much creativity we've seen everything from kratos to mario to zelda of fist <laughs> you name it there has been it it's crazy cooperators insurance in yarmouth came on board and sponsored our amazing volunteer shirts um so thank you thank you so much royal lepage atlantic sponsored our vip bags which have been a huge hit with a uh, free board game inside and uh, comic and other benefits early access so check out the vip bags they're definitely gonna be back for 2024 uh the yarmouth mall sponsored our on-site escape room which has been a huge hit um that has been the escape room that lisette and the yarmouth county museum has run is um basically escape a video game 
It is really cool. Um, so thank you so much to the Yarmouth Mall. Tusket Ford, Paradise Bistro, and Rudders um, all came on board for table sponsorship, which is amazing, sponsoring the gaming tables. Uh, Gator Bite Computers has been huge in supporting and sponsoring the event. Um, one of the coolest little local shops you can find around in southwest Nova Scotia and Yarmouth. And they've been around for a long and time. And they've been around for a long time. Um, Really, really thankful for uh, Chris and Jan's support there. And uh, last but not least, we can't show to, uh, can't show out enough the Rod Grant Hotel for hosting this event this weekend. That has been huge. You know, you can't do it without a venue. You need that. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, it's been great. We have been just so thankful for the Rod Grant to host us in 2022, 2019, and 2023. Um, our first three years here, and uh, it's been great. So COVID pulled the rug out from a lot of people's festivals and events. Uh, do you feel like you've fully rebounded? Yeah, that's a good question, and I feel like absolutely, and then some, more so, and it's been amazing. Um, 2019, we had our first year. Um, 2020, we were only like, oh gosh, we were like three months away, two months away from hosting it in 2020 again, and then COVID, and 2021, we couldn't do it. We got back to starting some small events, some game days in late 2021, early 2022, um, and then 2022 came, and got roaring back this year has been even bigger and better and wilder and I, i'm speechless I, the community support and positivity and, and uh the one of the biggest things about this weekend and and positive and amazing quotes that i heard was in regards to cosplay someone um a mother and their son um were entering cosplay they the mother said to me they haven't done arts and crafts with their kid in seven years and this event brought that together and that is why we do it that is amazing yeah it's not just individuals it's a family event it's a very family friendly event all ages everyone you know something for everyone at this event it's so wide open for there's a little something for everybody so many different events too cosplay video games vendors um, escape room trivia events Panels, workshops, D and D, role playing. We have Futura um, Metaphysical um, Store doing on-site palm readings and tarot cards, and that's really cool. Um, there's a little something for everyone. Now, your your video game side, uh, uh, you know, you've got retro as well as uh, current uh, gaming, but that's expanded quite a bit for this year, hasn't it? It really has. Um, we have more consoles. We have lo uh, longer tournaments. We have more players. Um, Super Smash Bros. was our biggest tournament with 32 people, and that's um, started um, in the afternoon. Then there's round robins, so it goes from 32 down to 16 tonight, and then there's going to be a top eight finals on the sa on the Sunday of the event, um, live streamed on Twitch. We're now on Twitch and YouTube and live streaming, and that's been a big ad ad addition too. Um, quick shout out to Nick Doucette because he has been amazing as our tech coordinator, um, just incredible. Um, video games, GameStop Yarmouth came on board this year too and brought some consoles down, and they've been here. Um, so shout out to Jeff and Orlina and the crew there um, for coming on down and hanging out and playing some brand new games they brought uh, some brand brand new stuff that just came out yesterday which is cool when it comes to the attendee list yep. have you got some early ideas of of what your breadth is and and the range of uh, folks that are attending that's a really good question um for numbers wise we definitely you know we'll have to crunch the numbers out the event but we definitely beat our 2022 um like i said earlier the, the the numbers is great but it's about quality of content and putting smiles on the faces of people um you have a great con for 50 people you have a great con for a thousand that's the most important thing um yeah so as far as a demographic we've seen a lot of families come out you know um two adults um one to three kids or so um all ages from you know you know people from everywhere five to six um to teenagers um very very wide range um tricky to pinpoint for sure um what about geography geography um so we were still mostly southwest nova scotia but we've had a few more you know um people be able to come from the city um vendors is where we really expanded the most um we have vendors from PEI this year, New Brunswick, um, Newfoundland, um, some amazing local vendors um, right from your own backyard that are in, you know, Argyle and the town of Yarmouth and just selling some amazing stuff. The vendors, wow, <laughs> it's been awesome. that's been really cool. Well, a lot of these vendors might have, you know, just be operating out of their house or out of their garage yeah, and absolutely. wouldn't have an opportunity to be out and about yeah. in the public. It's a showcase for local talent, for sure. Um, local creativity, local products. Um, something you may never see in a, in a Walmart, you know, for example. Um, some, you know, 
I can name all the vendors. There's posters. There's 3D printed stuff. There's uh, people that have made their own board game. There are metaphysical stones, crystals, potions, all that kind of cool stuff. Board games, video games, you name it. Trading cards. I could go on and on about the vendors. So, so cool. Um, definitely attendees-wise, we were affected a little bit, you know, with the, with the fires the, the, right now, the situation. That definitely had some cancellations. Um, didn't affect too, too much. Um, we've had... Uh, you but know, understandable. Understandable. Absolutely understandable. We don't hesitate to, you know, somebody says, I can't make it anymore. No problem at all. <laughs> a lot of the committees for a lot of the events and, and festivals are, are uh, legacy folks. People that have been involved in the same festival for 10, 15, 20 years. But you've had, you've had the benefit, of course, of attracting a lot of a younger crowd yeah absolutely but is we, that but is that driven by the content of the festival itself or is it really just driven by the fact that people want to pitch in i'd say probably a bit of both yeah the content really helps that it's um you know very very gaming focused which is a really wide range thing um and the community pitches together and comes together like like i've never seen you know before it's amazing um a lot of high school students getting a lot of really valuable um, experience right here. You know, you can be running a tournament, managing tech, uh, doing front desk, which is, you know, ma maybe managing some registrations, checking people in, making sure they're having a good time. Um, it's a great opportunity um, for people that um, volunteer. We can also um, just, you know, when you want some time off for the con, you get a complimentary pass. Like. Um, this year we did four hours of volunteering, gets you a day pass. Um, eight hours of volunteering gets you a weekend pass for you know, and uh, that's that's a draw for sure. Um, we can't do, we can't get everybody as volunteers because if everybody was volunteers, then you wouldn't have a con. <laughs> so uh, it's volunteer con, so, <laughs> which is probably a thing. <laughs> I'm not you know somewhere. <laughs> so after Sunday and the doors close and you kind of clean up, are you gonna get some sleep? Yep. I'm um, going to get some sleep. Everybody's taking Monday off work pretty much as you can. Um, you know, decompress, all that good stuff. Um, and then when do you start planning? When do we start planning? Right away? For 2024 already. It's already been underway. That's for sure. It's been, um, you know, some stuff. We, you know, we can't, we have to focus on the current year, you know, once it happens. But we always want to look at long term. We, we picture YCON as absolutely a staple event for the community in early summer. Before kids have gone, you know, for their summer vacations, um, we want to fit into the, the Yarmouth event schedule, too, which is very much, um, how would I put it, um, very much filled with a lot of other events. Seafest is mid-July. Colshed right. Col Col Music Festival is all August. There's National Acadian Day. Um, there's the tourism in me coming out. Um, you have to you know, find, your, find your niche, and I think we have, so we're always going to be that late. I look at right now, late May to early June. But you're not you're not a you know you're not buffered out by uh, holidays and and exactly. people being away. Yeah. Kids are still in school, so you pretty much are guaranteed people being yeah. around. Yeah, there's going to be people around. We um, being a convention, it's um, it's maybe similar to car shows. They don't want to conflict. You know, Yarmouth Car Show doesn't want to conflict with Shelburne Car Show, etc. Um, we don't want to conflict with other conventions. Um, there are other amazing ones in Nova Scotia. But they're usually there in the fall, right? There's a lot of more fall ones. Um, Capricorn is in September. That's Cape Breton in Sydney. Halcon's your biggest one, of course. Um, awesome at the Halifax Convention Center. Um, a lot of cool guests. Um, more panels and vendors. and uh, Yeah, so you, you, they're in um, typically October. Um, there's even some in PEI and uh, New Brunswick that we want to avoid the time so we can all, you know, Maybe sure. travel. There's travel. Um, I love going to Halcon when I can. Absolutely. And I'd love to go to Capricorn, Geekinox, all those. So, yeah. Um, but like you said, this is not... Um, everybody's got a passion for gaming. Our executive committee, I can't say enough about how passionate about this event that they are. It's so appreciative. We have an amazing team. I'll shout out um, Kellyanne Perry. He's my vice president and uh, the director of our de graphic design and helped with marketing. Uh, Kayla Fells is our uh, secretary on the board and events coordinator in cosplay. She does an incredible job. With that, uh, Mario Gaujean has created such a cool video games area. I cannot say enough about the work that Mario has done with this um, bringing the video games in, um, and he's also our game state coordinator. So we have these smaller events, and his name is Mario. And his so name is Mario, so it's perfect. 
I can't say enough. He's um, destined. He is destined for YCon. Um, Natasha York Phillip is just incredible with the volunteers. She's our volunteer coordinator, um, rallies the troops, you know, coordinates them. She's our community engagement officer as well. So she'll she's find, a people, um, people, people she's person. A people person. She'll find things like, um, you know, that Steve Barry is doing, for example, and we'll go attend that. We, like last year we had a tournament in the J, we had a team in the J strong tournament, um, which was really cool. Um, so after Natasha on my list here, uh, Dean Martin, who is our sponsorship and vendor coordinator this year, just another fantastic, amazing, incredible job lining up all these vendors, coordinating it. We started 2019 with eight vendors and then grew to last year was 16 or so. And now this year we're at 24 and more tables and it grows and grows and grows and the amount of different things you can find, um, returning vendors, new vendors, and Dean's done an amazing job. Uh, Judy Rosie is our treasurer and assists elsewhere where needed. That's uh, so important is the money behind this and registration and the front desk, and I cannot show out her enough. Um, Nick Doucette, like I mentioned earlier, tech and AV is such an important part of events now. No matter what you are, really, any kind of event. Um, well, you can tap into Nick's OCD. and Yeah, Nick has done an incredible job, and then he's introduced... Um, help introduce a system called start.gg which is a tournament st software where we can plug in the names of the tournaments create brackets round robins bra and uh swiss tournaments and conflicts so just people, makes it so much it's easier so much easier it's amazing and then uh you know the volunteers like i said that to keep scores and report back is huge um last but not least is matt hiltz um and you know matt i know you're gonna be listening to this you've plowed through so so much this weekend including a flat tire that has not been easy. You have done an incredible job creating all these board gaming li library, RPGs, um, just something for everybody. The Minecraft scavenger hunt has been amazing. That has been a kid-friendly event from 5 to 15 ages, and they get a little cute Minecraft pickaxe and then go find blocks around the convention that are crafted and then return them for Well, that a, was that block I almost uh, tripped over earlier. Yeah, that's what yeah. it was. All right. uh, you, you turn them in at the gaming table for a little candy and treat. And that's been such an amazing job. So thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much to everybody that I just mentioned. Horror, sci-fi, and fantasy author Jude Meyer came to Nova Scotia via Chicago. His wife is from Nova Scotia. We asked Jude about his journey to being the author that he is today. Oh, well, I started out as a very strange kid, uh, and then no one really discouraged that enough. <laughs> so I've just kind of stuck with it. Probably good that they did yeah. not. Uh, I'm also uh, fairly stubborn, and I couldn't stop the daydreams if I tried. So I figure writing them down is a good way of getting them out of my head. Do you feel that that was a bit of a, an escape? Uh, it's not really an escape. It's more of a different way of looking at the world. I'm not escaping from the world. I'm just seeing it differently. Um, so I like to turn things on their side, turn them on their head, change their colors, change their sizes, and look at things from different perspectives. Are you trying to add a sense of uh, realism into your stories, or is it really more the fantastic? Uh, I am a firm advocate of things that no one's ever seen before, but I do want to have, like, there's realism in the themes, but as far as the content, absolutely going for the strange. So the daydreams, are those primarily your inspiration, or are you drawing inspiration from other things? I like I said, it's I will set out to create inspiration and then look for it, right? So it's not about like things inspiring me. It's like me hunting down a specific flavor of a thing that I think is going to work to convey an idea, if that makes any sense. No, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So it's perfect not sense. like I'm sitting around waiting for ideas to drift in. I hunt them down, grab them, check them to see if they're the idea I need. If not, let them go and then hunt another one. Are right. you the sort of person that has a notebook beside their bed so that you wake up in the middle of the night, you have no, an idea, no, and write it down? Uh, I believe that if an idea cannot survive in my head, it's not going to survive in a reader's head. So I only use the ideas that actually stick with me. If a thing comes into my brain and then goes away, it obviously wasn't a good enough idea to be engaging. So you're not a native Nova Scotian, so give us a sense of how that journey got you to where you are. Oh, well, I married a Canadian. Well, that usually is how it goes. <laughs> and uh, I met her. I actually met my wife at the World 
horror convention uh, with a book I was in uh, called The Book of Dead Things. Is that not a red flag? Yeah, no, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a, a, a green flag for me. Um, and she actually listened to me read my story to confirm that I wasn't a terrible author before she decided to start hanging out with me, uh, which is great. So once I passed her approval, it was all good. Um, and what does she do? Uh, she's a painter, uh, and she is a fantastic painter. You can check her stuff out. Uh, it's Jill Cooper Artist, so you can find her. She paints a lot of seascapes, a lot of strong, powerful women. Uh, it's good stuff. And so how does that, how does that relate to what you're doing? Because it seems like you're on opposite ends of the spectrum. In terms of, well, I mean, she paints all my book covers, and she does do art for me now and again. Uh, and she, you know, she paints her waves and her strong women, but she's a big horror fan uh, as well. Like, there's a lot of crossover. It may not look like it in the product we produce, but there definitely is in our personalities. Now, you also mentioned that you self-publish your works. So give us a sense of how that works. So um, I spend a lot of time getting stories published for magazines that would then go under six months after I got published for the magazine. Um, and it became really tiresome. Ship it, you know, you send a story out to 10 different places, 15 different places. They finally send you $30, $60. And then they're gone two years later, right? Um, so about seven years ago, I started a Patreon, and I just decided I'm going to write a story every month for the people who are interested. Uh, and that has gone fantastically. I have seven years worth of stories, and then last year I realized I should put these into collections and start selling them. And uh, it's going fantastically. <laughs> it's wonderful. So are your works mostly short stories? Uh, for now, now I am working on novels, but... What I basically have is I've, I now have five collections worth of short stories done. I have published three of them. My next book, Mirror Bones, comes out in August. And then I'm hoping to have my last book, which is called, Fa not my last book, my last collection, uh, which is going to be called Fawn Summit, that I'm shooting for November, December. We'll see. And then I switch into novels. Then I'm done with the short stories. <laughs> now, are you going to take maybe a couple of good ideas out of the short stories and turn them into novels? Or are you going to go with a totally those, new idea? Most of those, um, if anything is too big to have been a short story, I've already left it out of the collections. Right? So there are some that could have at some point been contenders. But I took out all the bigger contenders and said, let's just let those keep cooking and maybe they'll grow to be big enough, right? Uh, especially since nowadays you don't have the same stigma on publishing novellas, right? Uh, there used to be a lot of gatekeeping with what got published. It was either short stories in magazines or novels by publishers. But now uh, people are publishing all sorts of things in all sorts of sizes. So um, I didn't have to be so judicious about whether, like, is this got to be parsed out to a short story or can it be a whole novel? There are some that are like halfway, and I'm fine leaving them halfway, and I'll probably publish them that way at some point, you know? How does your family feel about what your genre oh, of it. stories? They yeah? love it. Yeah, all my daughters. I have three daughters, and they're all science fiction, fantasy fans. Are you the cool dad? Uh, I try. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to ask them. You'd have to ask them. <laughs> right? When, when, it comes to, um, when it comes to the ideas... That you're, that you're putting into your short stories. Do you feel that because you're doing so many short stories that somewhere along the line you're just going to grab an idea that you had from before and it's going to be too similar to something that you've already got? No. No shortage of new ideas? No, there's no... Ideas are... Ideas are cheap and easy. It's execution that's really the difference, right? I mean, you could hang on 10 different authors an idea and give them 10 different specific things you want and you're going to get 10 different stories. It's the same thing with yourself. Um, you're generally not going to be self-repetitive. Every once in a while you'll find that you tend to like a particular color, maybe a little too much, right? <laughs> um, but that's pretty easy to fix, you know, and correct, right? And who cares if you like green? Put green in all your stories, <laughs> right? Not, I, I've never heard anyone complain, I like that author, except he uses a particular color too much, you know? It becomes an Easter egg of sorts. <laughs> yeah, right. you got to look for it. Yeah, I'm going to look for it. So, yep. Do you, do you think because you've made this a business as opposed to like a side hustle or a hobby that it adds extra stress or pressure on you? Uh, absolutely, but I, it's not because of the writing. 
it's because of all the other things and the learning curve on all this stuff. I mean, I am doing all my own stuff, so I wear a lot of hats, right? I am um, partially an editor, uh, although I do have people edit my work to make sure I'm not, you know, just caught in an echo chamber. Um, and but you're I, doing marketing, but you're do, doing, doing marketing, social media, but you're doing your formatting. I have to format it for publishing. I have to format it for ebook. Then I have to create graphics. I have to do stuff right. And the whole time, every month, I have to put out a story for my patrons. So like, you're constantly creating, um, like nonstop. Um, so some of the stages are obviously more fun than others. Right? Like, I love sitting down and writing. Uh, the daydream phase is great, but it's really not very productive. You know? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. Have you ever hit roadblocks? Because people talk about writer's block all the time. I but. don't hit writer's block. What I have had, so I find that if I have a writer's block, I'm not doing it right. Like the, I'm, I'm coming at it from the wrong angle or the scene is happening too soon or something. But I don't hit block because when you hit block, you just go on to something else and then come back to it later. Like there's plenty to do. Like I say, if I, if I feel like I'm blocked, I just go do formatting on a different project for a while or I'll write a short story and then come back to it. And half the time, block is gone. If I do that enough times that the block is not gone... It means I don't know what I'm doing, which means I should think about it more, <laughs> you know? Do you, do you find if you go to a social event, people are coming up to you say, I got an idea, I got an idea. Oh, everybody's got ideas. And they're fun to hear sometimes. But, I mean, like I said, I kind of think ideas are almost useless in their abundance. Um, everyone has thousands of ideas. Ideas are fun because they're easy. Uh, creating a thing out of an idea is hard. Creating, having an idea and then actually creating a thing that carries that idea within it. Like everybody can write something if you don't care what you're saying and you just want to, you don't have a destination. And that's often very great. You sometimes following your nose will lead to some fantastic fiction. But, you know, if you have an idea, you have to work to make the idea show up. And that's work and work is tricky. Like fiction is work. <laughs> Do you think that maybe the jump from shorter stories to a novel is going to take you a bit out of your element? Because now you've got time to develop the characters. It is a definitely different process, um, but I'm pretty confident. I've, I'm almost done with my first full novel. Uh, it's, called, it's a fantasy novel called Witchbow Daughters, uh, about a bunch of witches who live in a giant tree. <laughs> sure, right? you hear yeah. about that every day. Yeah, no, um, and, and, it, and it has a lot to do with um, tradition and how the traditions of the past may not solve the problems of the present. So, like, there's some definite like cultural connections, even though it's a bunch of witches living in a tree, right? Um, and I'm, I'd say, seventy five percent done with that. And it has. There have been moments where it's challenging to like sort the pacing because I'm used to things being shorter. But again. A tight novel, if you're used to putting a lot into a short story, what you wind up with is just a very dense novel that has lots of avenues. And that's a pretty... I like reading those. So that's what I kind of make. Right? Who do you read? Um, I don't read much when I'm writing because I get distracted and then I start to pair it. Right? Um, but my favorite is Roger Zelazny. I'm a huge Zelazny fan. And for horror, I love Clive Barker. Clive Barker is amazing with his creepy stuff uh, because he doesn't do anything normal. It's all strange and it's all new. And I'm, if there's one thing uh, I'm tired of, it's the same old. If I never see another elf or dwarf again, I'll be happy. Make room on the stage for someone else. Make room on the stage for modern monstrosities, for modern fa fantasies, you know? Uh, and there's a wonderful bunch of stuff happening. I need to catch up on a lot of it. Um, for a long time, science fiction in particular was incredibly gatekept. Um, and it was interesting because that gatekeeping process actually produced a fair bit of quality because there was gatekeeping, but it was quality from a particular group of people only. Um, whereas now, we don't have the gatekeepers, so there's a lot of fiction out there of a variety of quality, but a lot among the top end of it the voices are so much more interesting these days there's so much more opportunity at the table and it's worth 
you know, if there's only one good book out of every hundred published, the fact that those good books are coming from everyone is worth wading through the hundred others, right? Which I think is great. So if you were going to recommend some good reads to somebody that's just getting into a bit of this genre, yeah, what would you, what would you recommend? So, um, Other than your own stuff, which is kind of cool. So I'd say China Mayville is fantastic. Perdido Street Station is a great place to start because it's a really fantastic blending of science fiction with fantasy, with little elements of horror, and it's so well done, and there's like a bit of everything in that book, right? So Perdido Street Station is where I'd say start with that. If you don't like Perdido Street Station, you probably don't like this kind of thing, <laughs> right? If people want to reach out and uh, touch base with you or, or be able you to go, pick up your stuff, what's the best you way? You can find me on Facebook, Jude Meyer Author, Instagram, Jude Meyer Author, and you can go to my website, which is just judemeyer.ca, and I have a social button. Click it, and you find everything. Kara Pinkney Kroll made cosplay at the con, a bonding opportunity with her and her two sons with great success. Well, we started Hall the whole Halloween thing in the beginning. So Logan was, I want to be this for Halloween. I want to be that for Halloween. And then as he got older, he got wise to what a comic book convention was. And so when YCON happened the first time, we went just to see. And we, we weren't even really there to dress up at first. But Logan's like, oh, you're supposed to dress up at these things. So we, we have to dress up. And we went in we... And at first, like, he's a very shy kid, so he's not the one to walk up to you in public and say, hey, how are you? My name's Logan. My oldest son is that kid. So we kind of just filtered around. He had his Deadpool costume on. He's just kind of enjoying things. And then he met uh, Spooks Denat, who's a, who's a cosplayer from Halifax. Uh, his name is Jake. And he brought Logan out of his shell like I've never seen this this child react before. And since then, we just it's been like our goal every year to go to YCON, and uh, it's it's progressed into something absolutely fabulous. Where he talks to people in public, he has tons of friends now because we were going through stuff at the time during the first con, and it was just really hard to bring him out of his shell at that point. So. The fact that he can go somewhere and he can talk to strangers absolutely perplexes me. It's fabulous. Now, COVID was a kick in the shorts for most people. Did, did that set him back? That set him back. But Well, the two years that we were in that, well, the one year we were in the house doing the, the homeschool thing or the, the internet-based learning, um, we actually, it was really great because uh, our friend Jake from Halifax he couldn't go to cons either. So him and Logan actually Facebooked and emailed back and forth a whole lot talking about what they were going to do for the next con or what, what were you going to do for the next con? He, he was a valuable resource <laughs> for me to keep Logan kind of out of that kind of slump. We all got into during that two years of having to wear masks and stay in our houses for Logan. And I, like we were just, it became a, uh, a file building year. Like I probably have eight files of things that we haven't built yet that we want to build <laughs> that just what we're set for the next like eight or nine Y cons. <laughs> so that that's the best part that come out of that. But Logan suffered like everybody else did where he just kind of, he re if it wasn't for Jake and a couple other people, he retracted back into his shell a little bit where he wouldn't speak to people in public. Like even if we went shopping and it was a relative or somebody we knew, he had a hard time talking to them after the whole two year hiatus. But this has really worked well for him. It's worked exceptionally well for him. There's people like there were people, I don't know if you spoke to any of the, the other executive staff, but there are people on the executive staff that are just like, we can't believe that's Logan, that he, that he's so outgoing now where the first year they couldn't even get a hello out of him. So it's really, it's done him wonders the being involved in uh YCON and cosplay. And it's, and I think at first it was, the whole, I'm going to wear a mask. Nobody will know who I am. I could talk to them or I can interact with them without having to worry about them worrying about who I am. And now he's more open to wearing the costume that shows his face, which is, which is leaps and bounds. 
Now, is he the idea guy and you're the seamstress? <laughs> so nine times out of ten, he's the idea guy. Uh, I'm the seamstress. His older brother actually is a big contributor. My, I have a son who's 23, and he um, he's uh, on the low end of the autism spectrum. But he's very tactile. So him and I usually, like for this year's costume, uh, the, the pantser we built... Deacon actually came down and helped me with a few things. Like if I can't work it out in my head, Deacon definitely can work it out in his head. <laughs> um, Logan makes me sit for six months and research something before I start building it. Because even though, like we were saying at the con, you you build something and you put your influence on it. Logan is more of a, to the minute detail, there's a little bit of OCD there. So he wants it to be exactly the same as the reference image he gives me where I like to put a spin on it. So I would say Logan is all the ideas. Uh, next year I'm taking over. <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> one of the, one costume at least is going to be my idea only. So, and uh, that's, that's my goal is to have one for me and whatever Logan wants. And actually Deacon's planning on attending YCON next year too. So I actually have a full slate for costumes this year to build. <laughs> yeah. Now you had some trouble getting it in the car this year, didn't you? Uh, just a little bit. Uh, there were no passengers. Uh, Logan sat in the front seat and my, if, if anybody there's knows a lot of my moving son, parts of that costume, there's a lot of moving parts. Logan six one and he had his knees into the dash, I guess is the best way to say it. Even with my back seat down, I had trouble shutting doors in my car this year. <laughs> Which had is to a plan ahead of, a bit, right? I, I had to plan ahead. I don't complain about things like that. Whatever, whatever brings happiness to all. <laughs> I, I just shove it in my car. <laughs> the only problem I'm having this year with this one is uh, I have to store it. <laughs> and that's what it's still in my car right now. I guess is the best way to say it because that's <laughs> in storage right now. It's only been what, four days <laughs> and it's still in the car. I have to uh, get it set up in my craft space. And I've already told my other half that uh, we need to build a she shed because <laughs> I need a bigger space. You need a costume <laughs> burn of sorts. Yes, that's right. Well, I, I lucked out this year, too, because Paradise and Yarmouth Mall actually took uh, our third place entry for last year, and they've had it on display for about six months now, oh, which nice. I got to thank Kayla and them for doing that. It's 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 nice to see. I'm not, like I said at the con, I'm not a vain person, but I hate to see my costumes sit in a box when they can't be enjoyed by others. So if I can put something up somewhere, I always put it up somewhere. And hope, hopefully maybe somebody will call me tomorrow and say, hey, can we set that pantser up in our store? <laughs> because that way that would help me get it out and not just sitting in a closet somewhere. Now, how far ahead are, are you planning this? And are you worried that whatever you're planning for for next time around might not be the quote unquote in thing anymore? Or does it matter? I don't. I don't worry too much about the in thing. It's it's more like what what the boys want to be. Um my plan for next year, I actually have, I have an extra plan because I was talking to other people, but I'd like to build something like Logan's thinking about his already. I'll give him two more months to think about what he wants to be because Logan's the one that's a little bit more indecisive. Deacon has already told me what he wants to be so that I'm already doing reference work for that one for next year. Uh, there's a potential that Logan Deacon's costume might go to Halcon. So I actually might be, start building again in the next week or two to do that costume up. Um, neither one of them want to bring the pantser to Halifax because they said it was too hot. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. They, it needs, it needs fans is what they said. Um, and Logan has talked about bringing uh, his skull kick costume from last year to Halifax. He's, he's thinking about that, but he hasn't quite decided yet. I want to build a, uh, I, like I said before, I want to do a build for me. Um, I actually want to do a build. I'm thinking about doing a large puppet for next year if I don't do it sooner. And I want to use it to fundraise for um, people who need donations for things like IWK or or things like So it would be something that went that if they want it to set up some, a booth or something, somebody takes pictures with it or all that funding would go back into the community. So that's a nice idea. That's, that's my, that's my goal. Yeah. I actually have two ideas. One, one is a large dinosaur and uh, somebody actually asked me if I would ever think about doing anything for the Dr. Who crowd while I was wow. at YCON this weekend. And I totally would because Logan actually loves Dr. Who. So we would, we would uh, do something along those lines, something moving, maybe remote control. That's all I'm going to say. There's plenty of fodder <laughs> in the Doctor Who series to work There with. really is, yeah. And I always, and like I said at YCON too, I would never do, 
I love Star Wars, but I would never do anything Star Wars. And I know I think the Hoovians are a little bit the same way, where they they kind of they stick to detail. Yeah. And the thing I want to build for the Doctor Who stuff, um, there's lots of planning online for it, so I would try to keep it as accurate as possible. That it would be the only thing that I think I ever built that would be almost totally accurate. I I'll have to throw something in that's mine, but it'd be almost totally accurate to spec. The internet's a wonderful yeah. thing. I love the internet. <laughs> <laughs> only only about uh, this year, like the only, I will say though, this year with this year's costume, um, the internet helped out a lot because I didn't know the context at first of what I was building, but I only, there wasn't a lot of uh, information for me to use from the internet to build it because Believe it or not, that costume, and not a lot of people build that costume to wear. I've only found two people online that have documented building that costume. And do you do you document your process? You take pictures I all the way along? This year and, I did. Yeah? This year I did for all the other Call of Duty people, or the Call of Duty moms and dads that say, oh my God, my kid wants to be this, and I don't know how to build it. So I actually have documented it for this year. I haven't posted it yet, but I'm gonna, I have to find the right forum so I can just slide it in and people can pick it up. Well, I think, you, you know, certainly you're the, uh, the poster person for the con being a family event. Yes, and I, I like I like seeing the families there too. It was great. A lot of the group uh, category this year was fabulous with the very little kids. <laughs> Mario Goujon is the video games coordinator and games day coordinator. We asked him about what was new for the weekend. Uh, first, we decided to introduce a new tournament. We have our traditional Mario Kart and Smash Brothers. Decided to add a couple of challenges. We had the old uh, NES Punch Out Time Challenge, and we had a DK Point Challenge on the Super Nintendo. And we also decided to go, uh, while we were going retro, a Pokemon Stadium Draft Generation 1 tournament, which was really a, a success. Uh, but also, I will say uh, kudos to our uh, volunteer uh, executive committee, uh, Nick Doucette, who's been uh, bringing in all the gear. And actually, we're broadcasting live, and there's a chance for people, family and friends, to look at, uh, at their loved ones playing online. And it's been a very big step up from last year. So what, what have you learned from this year that you'll take ahead into next year? I mean, obviously, you want to try to grow. Yeah, I, I mean, we're always open ears. Like, we're doing this for the community. So when people come up with a suggestion, we're always open ears and always open to new ideas. Like, uh, a, a few more ideas was brought up for different games. I'm going to leave some surprise also because th th that's part of the fun is, like, come out with a surprise term and people, oh, man, I didn't think of that. Like, we should totally play that game. So... Uh, but I think we have our standalone, uh, as you can tell, even from the background, you can still feel people from Smash Brothers like they're having a ball in there. So uh, we got to keep those solid uh, foundation tournaments and then just come up with some new ideas and see what, uh, what gets the people going or not. The live streaming obviously is, is added a bit of a different dimension to the whole thing. Do you see that as a big plus? Absolutely. I actually was my first uh, uh, experience as a commentator. Me and uh, Joel, uh, one of our one of my right hand man for video games, commentated on uh, the Mario Kart tournament, which was absolutely epic. And now Malcolm and David uh, Philip are doing the com uh, commentary on uh, Smash Brothers right now. So it's uh, it brought it to a whole new level. Make it sounds almost like E8 Sportish like uh, level, like which is kind of nice for Yarmut, right? Do you see live streaming being a, uh, a more broader component maybe for next year in, into some of the other areas of the con? Definitely. I mean, there are always some tweaks, technicalities and stuff like that that we were talking, Nick and I, earlier. Uh, some Something to do with the connection, wireless versus wired, and depending if it's open to public or not. All a little technicalities, but uh, we've done it for the first time now, live streaming to that level. So we're learning from some of the bumps and hiccups from this year and hoping to even amp it up more next year. So this doesn't happen without sponsors and without volunteers, so I'll give you a chance to shout out. Oh, so many shout outs. I mean, uh, first, as a video games guy, the first big sponsor that comes to mind is Gator Bytes. They've been helping us left, right, and center, any equipment required, stuff like that. But I will say, like, I, I can't think of enough, uh, of enough sponsor in the area uh, that like provide uh, in other fields I, I i i i can't name them all because they would put everybody else to shame and all that but uh being a video games guy that's what the first one comes to mind but also the numerous volunteers their time 
and volunteering their equipment. Like a lot of them, like uh, I kind of joke about the, uh, I would say 25 to 30 percent of the gear outside for open play is my personal equipment for video games day. But there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, gear that was brought by volunteers and just trying to make a, a big community event work, you know. Kellyanne Perry is a vice president and graphic design coordinator, and we chatted with her after the con weekend about what's next. We're starting a few little baby steps for towards 2024 and next year's convention. Um, trying to secure our location and confirm everything for our location for next year. We might have some surprises there. Uh, and mostly just taking it a little bit easy for the summer until we get ramped up again in the summer or in September. We just have to do our, uh, we call it a postmortem to hash out everything between all of us and what we've observed and what worked amazing and what might not have worked as well and, and get that fresh. And so we can enjoy our summer. So over the course of the, the YCON weekend, you're, you're in, you're everywhere. And so just based on your own observations, have you got a sense of, you know, what worked for this year and what might need some adjustment for next time around? Absolutely. Um, the vendors were amazing this year. Uh, I heard lots of feedback on the layout of the vendors area um, and how it's easy to see everything, easily accessible, all that fun stuff. Uh, the games went really well. I think we may make a return to the original format where uh, we had game runners and it was scheduled out. So if someone wanted to play, I don't know, let's say Sushi Go, they would put it on a, they would pre-register to run that game in a certain time slot or several um, and go that route. So that might be something we revisit for next year. Uh, we want to get some more enthusiasm and some more participation with uh, the miniature painting see if we can hype that up a little bit but what happened like this year was fantastic the entries were great everybody was pumped that uh, had entered we just hope we get a few more people there um cosplay was amazing all good things there video games went really well all in all um not too much to improve upon but I'm sure once we hash things out, uh, we'll figure out a few things to tweak and quirk and all that fun stuff. Now, the video game side of things was a little bit different this year in, in so much that you were you were broadcasting on Twitch and live streaming and so on. Have you got any feedback on that? How did that go? Um, it went okay. Uh, the infrastructure didn't work so well for the streaming because of the bandwidth that we had allotted to us. Um, but if we had a better internet connection, it would have been phenomenal. Um, I know the idea was to stream most of the day Saturday, just the convention floor, the gaming, the vendors. Um, but it just, it kept uh, quitting on us because of the lack of bandwidth. So that's something we'll check for next year. Yeah, well, it's certainly one of those things that you, you learn as you go. I mean, there's only so much you can do as far as bandwidth goes. Mm hmm Absolutely. So yeah, But but in theory, but in theory, I mean that was a that was a novel idea. I'm sure that, you know, for the times that you were quote unquote connected, uh, people were appreciative of being able to tune in and watch. Oh, absolutely. Even for the like the finals and the semifinals for Smash Bros. and Mario Kart. Rather than have everybody crammed in that little room, um, it was streaming on the TV out in the in the main lobby, and it was great. So people could just hang out and watch out there, and it gave much more flexibility for people to see what was going on without necessarily leaving what they were doing. Well, and that's the thing too is you know if if you're you, you, sometimes you don't know how popular a particular thing is going to be until all of a sudden you got no room and you got people lined up out in the halls and everybody's kind of crammed in a small room and it's hot and it's stuffy and, and whatever. But, you know, those are good problems to have. Absolutely. The popularity of it is definitely unprecedented. So it's wonderful to uh, be able to spread it out a little bit more and allow more accessibility for people to see it. Now you had a... a did you have an, uh, a, a large number of, of entries into cosplay? It seemed like there was quite a few people lined up for it. 
Absolutely. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but there was definitely far more entrance this year than there was last year. Um, and even as far as non-entrance, there was people that just wanted to dress up and cosplay and they had no interest in um, being judged or going through that criteria. So there was a lot of people that fall, fell under that as well. Now, you mentioned about the miniature painting. I, I think that, you know, there's probably a lot more people in the area that are doing the miniature painting, but just probably feel, yeah, my stuff's not that good. It's, you know, I, I but certainly encourage them to reach out and, and, and put their entries in. A hundred percent, because there could be a lot of people that are, are new to the hobby and maybe, you know, by networking, we'll get some paint nights going, we'll get some stuff you know, just casual laid back stuff so that it'll grow their confidence in their painting skill so that they can feel like they can enter next year. Cause it does, it's not, it's not an elitist thing. It's, it's for fun. It's everybody and anybody can enter their, their paintings and their miniatures. So. And like anything else, practice, 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 but you also had a couple of panels where you had some people there that were, that were showcasing the painting. Yes, absolutely. And that's another area we'd like to flesh out a little bit more next year, too. See if we can uh, pick up some guests, some more guests, and get a few more panels going. That'll be something uh, to do for next year. But it's definitely the panels and the content that we had were really great. And people were really enthused about things. So it was good. Now, you mentioned the vendor area was really popular. I mean, you had a wait list, didn't you? Yeah, we did. There's people that wanted to be a vendor and they didn't, uh, we didn't have room for them due to space. Again, it's a good problem to have, but it, it's a bit of a challenge locally. There's only so many venues that you can tap into. Absolutely. That's definitely been a big challenge. And then it's, it's trying to make the, the most of the space that we do have. So um, between Dean and Malcolm and, and the people that were in charge of, finagling the venue uh, as far as floor plan and stuff like that. I think they did an excellent job of, of making do of every square inch that we had. Now an event like this doesn't go on. And I, I'm like a broken record. People hear me say this every time we talk about events, but the events like this do not go on without volunteers and without sponsors. Absolutely. The volunteers, we had so many volunteers this year. It was super phenomenal to see. And a lot of the kids like to get involved because, I mean, there's not many kids that don't enjoy video games or games in general, right? So it's really nice to get them involved and, and get them engaged and interested in all that stuff. So we've had a ton of volunteers. Sponsors, we had quite a few sponsors, um, some from different areas that we didn't really um, expect, uh, like insurance companies and stuff. But uh, we're hoping to tap into a few different avenues next year and hopefully get some bigger and better sponsors on, in addition to what we have. Excellent, excellent. So any uh, words of advice for anybody that's considering YCON 2024? Keep your eyes peeled on YarmouthCon.com and on all our socials, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram. Um, we've got a Twitch uh, channel, which we'll be using sporadically. And you can get to those all via the website. Um, I'm excited for 2024. It's going to be big things, exciting things, and hopefully our biggest year yet is what the plan is. And the dates are set for next year's con, by the way, May 31st to June 2nd, 2024. Check out YarmouthCon.com for all the details. I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this has been Outside My Window. <laughs> <laughs>